Hello, my name's Tom. Um, I'm 37 years old, which makes most of you at least half my age. Um, I'm afraid I don't have any new videos. I don't have any um, cool tech. I don't have any driverless cars. I don't have any new phones. I don't have any Google Glasses. I do have a pen, <laughs> but I'm going to use this. Um, so, because I always wanted to say this, when I was your age, <laughs> the web was a few years old. There were 10,000 servers um, and 10 million web users. Now, there are 2.5 billion web users, and the internet is blah, blah, huge, blah, not important. <laughs> not what we're going to talk about. That web, um, that web was sort of very physical. And it was a new thing. It was the autumn of 1994. I just had my first HTML lesson. Um, and I just got my first email address. And it was a very, you, you can still feel the physicality of that web because we talk about it in physical terms. We talk about pages. We talk about addresses. What we're going to talk about is your internet, not my internet. Um, I don't actually have any <coughs> answers for you tonight, but I just have a few questions. And the, the main one is going to be, what are you going to do with it? Because it doesn't stop here. I mean, it doesn't, this, this, this is not it. We don't stop at tablets and screens and phones for the rest of time, and this is how it all works. We move, and we're moving at an incredible pace. So we're going to explore that world for 10 minutes. Um, I'm going to go a little bit fast. So I hope you're ready for that, because I don't have time to go slowly. <laughs> Between us, when I look at the internet, I kind of just want to do a drawing. I kind of go, eh. and I'm back in that classroom in 1994 going, this sucks. <laughs> um, and I keep pushing, and we keep pushing, and Google keep pushing, because we know there is, there's somewhere else to go. There's, we know there's more to do, and there's, 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 there's further places to go. But in 1994, I thought, this sucks, and I wanted to be an artist. In 1999, I gave up trying to be an artist, um, and I joined a dot-com startup. And um, we had a very cool idea. It was, a, it was a sort of social network for elite universities. This is 1999. Um, unfortunately, um, sort of, no one had thought up the idea of social networks at that point. And in 2001, the bubble burst. We all lost our jobs, and I went and sat in my back garden and borrowed a laptop and learnt to code. Now I work with Google. Um, I work in a group called the Creative Lab. It's filled with young, incredibly talented, brilliant people who really want to make a difference in the world. Personally, I work with culture. I get to work with um, artists and cultural institutes around the, around the globe looking at how they might use digital technology, how we might move their practice forward using the internet. So not so much digitising old culture as creating new culture that can only exist using the internet. And what does that mean? It means I got to work with orchestras and things on things like our YouTube Symphony Orchestra. I got to work with curators at the Guggenheim. I got to go to Sundance and launch a film with Ridley Scott. Um, I got to work on the Google Art Project. Get to do these crazy things. At the moment, in keeping with the theme, um, I'm working with the Royal Shakespeare Company on a play about fairies. Um, <laughs> and social media. And I'm, we're making a book about maps. And what else are we doing? There's, there's a world of things that we're, we're, we're playing with. We're playing at the edges between art and technology. And frankly, sometimes that looks a little bit clumsy. Um, how many of you have your own web page, not including Facebook, that, that, that you coded? Because it's pretty easy. <laughs> it really is. It's one of the things I really like about my internet. And I'm going to assume from that response that not many of you have your own phone app that you've coded. No, no, because that's quite hard. <laughs> um, but it does make me look at links in a new light. It makes me look at, at, at URLs, hyperlinks, things you click, buttons, in a new light. Because basically, they're an incredible invention. 
This, this thing, it's the simplest, most elegant, most universally accessible way of getting you to do something, to initiate an action. Um, and the internet, my internet, was basically just a series of pages on computers around the world which were connected by things that you clicked. <coughs> that was it. Sounds rather old-fashioned, really. It's incredibly old school. In your internet, on your phones, this is much less clear. Can you click from one app to the other? Can you click things in real life? Can you click the screen? <laughs> um, no, you can't at the moment. And actually, that makes me slightly frustrated, because I want to know why you can't. Why can't you? What is going to replace the click? Is it, is it the swipe or, or the scan? Is it the bump or the gesture? Or better still, it just knows. <laughs> you can laugh. <laughs> so now you're trying to think of all the other things that can initiate an action, that can trigger something. Um, especially if the device knows a few details about you, like who you are, where you've been, where you're going to. This is context. Um, context is important in making decisions. So then you can start to use some information, like your location or the temperature, proximity, sounds, velocity, weather, signal strength, density, face recognition, emotion recognition, keywords, or time, or any combination. These all become equivalent of clicks. And then you work in combinations of um, in data that comes from your social network, that comes from your calendar, that comes from your browser history or your preferences. There are gazillions of ways to click in your internet. And as that internet becomes less tangible, becomes more all around us, there's so much space to invent. Things can happen just because, not because you clicked a button. In your internet, just being in a certain place at a certain time, in certain weather, could be enough to choose between whether you order a flat white or a frappuccino, or whether to text your girlfriend or your mum. <laughs> so let's recap that. In my internet, information was fixed in code that had to be read by browsers on a screen. In your internet, the information is an endless flow of data that appears only where and when it is needed. And at the moment, that data seems to exist in three forms. It exists in streams and tools and signals. First are streams. We all understand streams. Everything's a stream, timelines are a stream, Facebook's a stream, Twitter's a stream, you know, YouTube's a stream, playlists, the news, it, all, it all feels like everything. Streams literally move past you like they are fixed in time. It's like standing in a river. You can go back, like this video, you can go back and find it again, but, but it, it is past you now. It is only of that moment. Then we have tools. Tools are, well, like tools. <laughs> really. Like we had maps and notebooks and cameras. So we have maps and notebooks and cameras on our devices. Anything that lets you do something functional. Games are tools. They distract you. You pick them up, they distract you, you put them down. They're just like knitting. <laughs> Except you can't knit on an iPad. So streams and tools, that's basically most of it. But the last one is the most interesting. Signals, alerts, Stuff on your phone that happens because of when or where you are. The, the, the stuff we were just talking about. So, you know, things that can predict if you want to tune into a screen, stream, or that there's an offer at Macca's over the road, or that it's your friend's birthday. Information that is specific to you at that moment, like you're about to miss the bus that you normally take. That information is only useful to you. That's what we mean by contextual data. Thinking that way changes the way we think about the world, so we need to change the way we think. And how do we get these signals at the moment? It's on your phone. But we're just around the corner from some pretty interesting wearable technology. So, you know, there's glasses and watches, bendable screens, transparent touch screens, digital ink. Uh, or think about physical tech, like, like the night fuel band that lives on your arm and, and keeps your personal data there like a little invisible personal trainer. Um, meanwhile, the Dutch are testing vibro belts that <coughs> buzz against you and nudge you in the direction that you should be cycling because it's a lot safer than you looking at a screen. And it also keeps you up so you're experiencing the world. 
Philips are trying to get their machines to sing to us rather than just beep to tell us what's going on. So we have this future of digital that might be delivered haptically by touch or um, sonically. So we, let's start with wearable tech. Devices that mediate the world for you, like, like watches or phones or clothes or glasses, um, or anything, even subcutaneous technology. This is information that's delivered to you without interrupting the rest of the world. And it happens discreetly, showing you useful info or recording the world the way you see it. It's checking a map on your wrist, or maybe you have that nail varnish that gives you text alerts and tells you what time it is. And speech becomes incredibly important as we begin to use the same form of communication with computers as we do with each other. What happens then? How do we change? What will our speech will modulate? And screens, you know, these things have been around for ages and they're going to stay here, but they're going to change. So imagine if your touch screen was actually a matte, kind of fibrous matter that looked a bit like a curtain. What would you do with it? How would that change? the information that you wanted to put there. Anyone here remember Tamagotchi? <laughs> Excellent. Imagine a future with lots of little computers. Little computers that um, feel very personal to you, like a pen that spell checks for you, or a little heart that gives you relationship advice. <laughs> little computers that are more like friends that you can rely on for the right information. Musical boxes from Spotify. In fact, I'm a huge fan of the physical world. I might work at Google, but I'm, I'm, I'm really into stuff. And I'm, there's a theory about this called biophilia. And biophilia suggests that um, we are naturally attached to the organic world around us, and we respond to this. So we like natural things over synthetic things, which would mean we like wood rather than plastic. We like being on the beach rather than under strip lights. We like it being in natural fibre rather than nylon. And if you buy that, then we won't be happy until we get all of this information out from behind the glass and the plastic and, and put it in natural, organic forms, the ones that are most useful to us, on bus tickets or tabletops or in the margin of the book that you're reading or whispered to you by the tree that you're under. <laughs> How about a wallpaper that responds to your mood or keys that tell you when to leave, coffee cups that give us diet advice? <laughs> or pens that record while I'm, while I'm talking. Um, now, maybe it's because I'm old, but I really like that physical world. I want to go back to that world of objects, um, and I just want to make them magical. And you have to do that. You have to build a normal world filled with enchantment. That's your job, like magical pens. And where might all this end up? Well. I have no idea. <laughs> I don't. And this is another interesting thing, because if you think about this idea that we're going to live in a world where all this information is gathered together in an integrated form, and, and, and in order for that to work well and for it to be synchronised, you'd imagine that it would have to be kept in one, one place, one sort of storing place. But it won't, for the same reason that we all have 174 different <coughs> passwords. Or rather, we have one password and 174 different sites. <laughs> because we use simple tools to create complex solutions. We don't really generally use complex tools to create simple solutions. So, uh, I mean, additionally, as a species, we're pretty naturally competitive. It seems more likely that we'll end up with um, a non-integrated world filled with lots and lots of smaller companies all offering particularly excellent services rather than one big one. Maybe we end up with a fully open web where all of these services and streams combine together and you can read your alerts on screens or glasses or coffee cups or wallpaper or Tamagotchi. Or maybe not. Maybe we'll end up with multiple internets for different aspects of our lives, like you subscribe to TV networks. Maybe we end up with a world where there are multiple nets. What would that be like? Would that be like multiple galaxies, multiple dimensions? It literally would be a world of multiple realities. And when you think about that, you begin to realise that we're actually at a rather exciting but clumsy launch phase of the next internet, of your internet. And what does this mean to you? <coughs> well, you use it. It's your world. Um, my personal request is that you make art. But um, 
I think that might fall on deaf ears. Um, so certainly you should be thinking about this in everything, that we are moving forwards, that time doesn't stop, that progress moves forward. And I guess most importantly, that you are now where I was then, back when I was looking at my internet 20 years ago thinking, this sucks, that's where you are now. So it's an incredible time <laughs> to be your age. And the internet that you make will blow me and your parents away. So you have to go and create that world. You have to go and create the world that you want. Personally, I look forward to a day when the world is augmented with data, when we have physical reality filled with information. And I think that will be soon. But don't worry if you think that augmented reality sucks. Because pretty soon, in your lifetimes, in your internets, all of that will change. Thank you very much.